So, this is the lemma we are going to prove today amongst other things of course, and uh, I might have to come back and modify the statement of this lemma. This square root u could be 1 over square root u, but we will see. Okay, good. So, the Fourier what is Fourier transform that is we start with definition. So, it is defined function f n as f s square u. So, all I have done is extend the definition of function n from integers to all numbers. Now, Fourier transform can be defined for just about any function as long as there is it satisfies some reasonable convergence properties, but there are two distinctions depending on what the function is like. If the function is periodic with a certain period, then you only consider the that period the interval of the period you know to define the Fourier transform, because after that it is all same. On the other hand, if the function is aperiodic, you just take that the period is infinity and the consider the whole function. So, in this particular case, this is not periodic, there is no clearly no period here. So, we just define the Fourier transform to be t integral from minus infinity to plus infinity you just take the whole entire span for the function f of s e to the minus 2 pi i s t d s multiply the function by e to the minus 2 pi i s t and integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. And of course, one has to see whether this there is this is well defined, and for that one can or one should show that the absolute value of this integral converges. In case of the function we are looking at, certainly it does converge. This is really very very rapidly decaying function, so that is no problem. Okay. <coughs> Now, the question is what is this? Well, we know it is minus infinity plus infinity e to the minus pi s square u e to the minus 2 pi s t d s. And what I want to show is that this is actually same as the original function. That is the target, or well, not quite the same. There is up to a multiplication factor by square root of u. Now, for that, we will use a little trick. Just observe here. There is a pi here and a pi here, so pi can be taken out in common. So let's actually just write this in a slightly more simple form. Minus pi then you have s square u plus 2 i s t. s square u plus 2 i s t. So, this almost suggests that we should try to complete the square and see what we get out of this. What do you need to complete the square? Minus t square by u, and of course, plus t square by u. Yes. Now this last k has nothing to do with s, so we can just pull it out.
Okay. This is it's basically uh, this expression is s square root u plus i t by square root. U. Now all then we need to do is now we just let z be s square root u plus i t by square root u. So so far s u o t u s u t were all reals. Now we move into the complex number let by letting z be this and express this integral as a in terms of z. So, where does z go from? When s goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, what happens to z? Yeah, so, it just goes from minus infinity plus i t by square root u plus infinity plus i t by square root u e to the minus pi z square, that is what you get here. And what happens to d s? So, u t are fixed, they do not vary. So, let us take d z is d s root u. So, d z by root u. So, we have integral of this form which is somewhat simpler except that now it is a complex integral. Now, we know some ways of handling complex integrals. So, let us try to see what happens with this. If you want to integrate it from minus infinity plus this to plus infinity plus the same quantity that is like a where does this go from? Uh, t by square root u, which uh, it is maybe somewhere here, and the integral is along this line minus infinity plus infinity. So, we can use the standard tricks that is. Uh, Just integrate it from minus r to plus r, and then we'll send r to infinity. So we consider minus r plus i t plus. And this integral again will write as okay, should um, let us just go here once again. from here to here. So, let us define a contour whichever and let us take a rectangle. And let us this with the domain D. So, what is the integral of this? to the minus pi z square d z along the domain boundary of this domain d. This you should know. Zero, there is no pole, the integrand has no pole 
anywhere. So, this is 0. Okay. So, this implies that uh, 0 equals now if you see that uh, if you are traversing it counter clockwise minus r plus t by square root u r plus i t by square root u plus r plus i t by square root u to r plus v Now, if you consider out of these, uh, the second and fourth integral, these two are more or less same, similar to each other, except that uh, you have uh, one is minus r, one is plus r going from here to here and other is going from here to here. And you have uh, your integrand in e to the minus pi z square. If you look at the absolute value again using the similar ideas that we have been doing, what is the absolute value of this e to the minus pi z square as you move along these two vertical red lines. e to the minus pi is r square. Uh, so, at least it is a, it will at least e to the minus pi r square right and since it is not uh, in the denominator we can say that uh, it is bounded this integral is bounded by uh, at least the integrand is bounded by 1 over let me just write this. Let's just pick one of them. Say R plus to R plus I V. This is less than equal to. And then this is of course bounded by order. Assuming T is and V is T U V to be constants of fixed values. Okay. And as R goes to infinity this goes to 0. And the same happens with the fourth integral. And this gives that
that the first and third integrals are equal when you take the limit. Oh, it's this is has nothing to do with integral. This comes out, and then you in, you are integrating dz. It's not even r. Sorry. This is actually. V minus t by square root u, so that's just one. It's assuming that v t u; these are all fixed numbers, and it's r that I'm sending to infinity. So it's just that. Okay, so the that basically says that the second integral and the fourth integral vanish as r goes to infinity, which means that sum of first and third integral is 0. So, the third integral is in the opposite direction minus 2 plus. So, if you swap this you basically get integrating along this line is same as integrating along this line, which therefore, tells us that if you look at this we were integrating along this line. Instead of that if you integrate it along, along any other line horizontal line from minus infinity to plus infinity the result will be the same. Okay. So, that is the first step of our evaluation of the integral. So, what we can say is therefore, in particular Where was it? This equals let us forget about the complex part, just integrate along the x axis, the real. Okay, so this is a further simplification. We are now had this simple integral over the comp, which is a complex integral. We have now got it as a real integral. Although it's sometimes easier to evaluate real integral through complex integrals, but in this case, it's easier to just evaluate the real integral directly. And this is integrated by a very neat trick. Actually, the integral of this is one. And to show that, let's just give it a name minus infinity to plus infinity e to the minus pi y square d y. This is a normal distribution this is basically the and you are just saying that this is the probability mass is 1 which is all there is. So, if you can you prove this that this integral will be 1 it is very simple actually just look look at i square this again is nice trick as I said. So, just multiply i with itself you get double integrals and this is now an area integral over a plane where you take the d x d y is a rectangle and you integrate along the value along that and you add up all. So, it is an integral over the entire plane two dimensional plane not a complex plane, but normal r 2 right. Now, this integral I can rewrite using polar coordinates. Okay.
So, polar coordinates will be r and theta, how will r will be going from 0 to infinity and theta will be going from 0 to 2 pi. What happens to the integrand e to the minus pi x square plus y square, x square plus y square is r square. So, that is minus pi r square. What happens to dx dy? dx dy is a tiny rectangle that I am going to change with so here is a dx dy this I will replace with in the polar coordinates. So, this is x this is y the polar coordinate I will replace with r and this is d theta. with this piece. So, it is r and this is d r and this is d theta. The, this area is r d theta d r. It is pretty standard, but I thought I will just mention it anyway. Okay, and now, you see that this is because there is no d theta to you get 2 pi here 0 to infinity e to the minus pi r square r t r. And this you integrate you get 1. The integrating this is pretty straightforward. Just do a k equals r square and Okay, so, now going back to where we started from, what did we get? We showed now we have shown that this integral is 1 and therefore, my Fourier transform f hat of t is equal to 1 over square root u e to the minus pi t square by u. Okay. So, I do need to change the statement this is minus. So, that is completes the proof of the lemma. Okay. So, of course, what I have shown is a much more general thing what this Fourier transform holds at every point not only at integral points, but all I need to use it for is integral points. All right. So, that now, if you recall, we started with this infinite sum and each term of the infinite sum was a e to the minus pi n square u and we took one term and then calculated its Fourier transform. Okay. But it is really this infinite sum we are interested in. So, let us now get back to the infinite sum. W, what was it? W u. Let us look at this particular function a little carefully. Okay, let me define another function associated with let us say capital F 
of uh, Let us define f of v as again a generalized version of w, where uh, again u is a something I fix and then we have this infinite sum minus infinity plus infinity e to the minus pi n plus v whole square. Now, for this we make this observation. f v is f v plus 1. Now, is this obvious? This is pretty obvious, right? Because uh, replacing v by v plus 1, you will just get n plus 1 plus v whole square, n going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, n plus 1 will also go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, this is a periodic function with period 1. And now again I will invoke Fourier analysis on this function, which is a different one than the previous. This is a periodic function. So, for periodic function uh, the Fourier analysis shows, which I will again show you in two, two minutes that f v can be written as this infinite sum. So, it is a infinite sum of e to the 2 pi i m v. These are all each one of this is a periodic function with period 1 right and this uh, you get this uh, each one of them is multiplied by C m which we call the Fourier coefficient corresponding to this particular frequency. So, this is really standard um, transformation of the function as a or representation of function as a uh, sum of sine waves. How do we get this? Well, that is pretty simple. Let us just define C m out of this. Uh, C m would be for this for this ok. Let us see how do we identify or extract out C m. So, this gives okay, not like consider. So, this is equal to of course, 0 to 1 you substitute this okay, let us make this n just to separate this out. Now, again using uniform convergences of things, we can swap the sums with integral. And 
this integral is easy to evaluate, this is going to be 1 if and only if m equals n, otherwise it is going to be 0. And so, this is equal to C n. C what is that? C n, yeah. So, this is this integral is non zero exactly when m equals n. So, all the terms in this infinite sum will vanish except when m equals n, and then it in that case this integral takes a value 1, and so you get exactly C n. So, that is why you can express this function which is periodic in terms of this infinite power series. Okay. Now, what do I want to show you? If we was this infinite sum, Okay, let us look at the C n in a slightly different way. See this also can be shown easily that C n actually is equals this integral. I will not show I will leave it for you to work this out. So, this is equal to 0 to 1 if you substitute for this for f v m going from minus infinity to plus infinity and f v was uh, to the this Now, this integral with this infinite sum you can merge as an integral going from minus infinity to plus infinity. And what happens to these guys? See, v was going from 0 to 1. Now, I will make v go from minus infinity to plus infinity. What happens to this? not 
making sense here. What was the Fourier transform defined as? S two pi S T. See what I want to show is that this is equal to and actually the exact form of a fat n does not matter. This is a general result that Fourier coefficients of this periodic function which is an infinite sum see capital F was defined as this infinite sum and this is a periodic function with period 1 right. For such a function the nth Fourier coefficient is actually equal to the Fourier transform of its nth term. Can you see how to prove this? So, this is C n that is how you start with and if you plug this in ok let us leave it I guess let me give you we are spending too much time on this. Let me give you this as an assignment anything that I cannot prove I am going to give as an assignment. it requires some manipulation of these integrals. Now, let us get back to now we are now close to what we want to prove. So, if you recall f v is this infinite sum c m e to the minus 2 pi i m v right f v by definition gives me what I am going from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus pi m square u. Uh, m plus sorry, m plus v square u and this is equal to m going from minus infinity to plus infinity c m is this f at n. So, f at n is we already know 1 over square root u e to the minus pi m square by right times of course e to the minus 2 pi i m v. So, we get this relationship. Now, in this relationship again we had proved a much stronger relationship than we need just plug v equals 0. What do we get? We get I am going from minus infinity to plus infinity plug v equals 0. So, we get e to the minus pi m square u equals this multiplier is all 1 when v is 0.
this is exactly what we needed because this is W U. Right, and this is one over u square root u w one by u. Okay, so we can conclude that w u is u to the minus half w. 1 by u and the whole point of this exercise was to derive this equation this relationship between w u and w 1 by u and let us go all the way back where we started from here. that same relate w with w 1 by u w u with w 1 by u and why did w u arise out where did this come from we had this capital W u, which is related to small w u by this formula and this capital W u actually occurred here in this relationship with of zeta function and gamma function in this inside this integral. So, let me just lift all of this and write it afresh there. Let us first establish capital W u was half of small w u minus half, right. This is what it was. Capital W u is half of small w u minus half. So, we can rewrite this relationship in terms of capital W. What do we get? W u is therefore 1 plus 2 capital W u is equal to u to the minus half. 1 plus 2 capital W 1 by u with this gives you the W 1 by u and this is what we will be eventually interested in is half of And this is the relationship we should remember. This is a takeaway from this one. Now, go back to that Riemann uh, equation, which uh, not Riemann equation, but the zeta function equation. And uh, let us create a new page, which is page. What did we have? Zeta z pi to the minus z by 2 gamma z by 2. Was it gamma z by 2? Yeah. Equals this integral which says 0 to infinity u to the z by 2 minus 1 times 
W U D. Okay. And let me refresh your memory that we had a problem in the convergence here when the real z is uh, less than 2, because then this part sort of diverges as, as uh, u comes close to infinite uh, 0. So, the problem really is when u is close to 0 then this may not converge and that is what we want to get along get away from. So, let me split it in two integrals this is a bad integral. 0 to 1, that is where bad things happen, plus 1 to infinity. There is no problem in 1 to infinity. In 1 to infinity, this in integrand converges absolutely. So, this integral converges to something a sensible amount, no matter what the value of z is, right. Because in this range 1 to infinity, w u which is a e to the minus u or, or worse. Or that is or even faster decaying one that will dominate u to the z by 2. Let us consider the bad part 0 to 1. And let us do a change in variable replace u by one over v. What happens to this? When u goes from zero to one, what happens to v? goes from infinite comes from infinity to 1. u to the z over 2 is becomes u to the oh sorry v to the 1 minus z by 2. w u becomes w 1 over v. What happens to d u? It becomes d v over v square with a negative sign. Okay. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, since there is a negative sign outside and the limits are also reversed, we can flip that both you go from 1 to infinity v to the minus 1 minus z by 2, because there is v square dividing this w 1 over v d v. So, everything is sensible here except w 1 over v, but we know how to handle w 1 over v that is 1 to infinity v to the minus 1 minus z by 2 w 1 over v we just go back and stick this in it is uh, therefore, half u to the v to the half 1 plus 2 w v minus 1 d v. Fine. So, I will leave it as a workout 
at home.